Okay, this is it. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Bob Atkins, and I have the pleasure of being the Director of New Jersey Health Initiatives, a statewide grant making program with the Robert Johnson Foundation. And I have the pleasure of moderating this panel, which means that I get to, you know, say two minutes, five minutes, whatever. Um, I will not read the bios of our, um, our panelists because you can read. But I will uh, tell you that it's, it's going to be an exciting panel. And uh, I, I just want to mention that I am, uh, my first job at nursing school, I was a, uh, a school nurse in the city of Camden. And, and lead was a huge issue, uh, obviously, 20 years ago when I started. And unfortunately, we haven't made that much progress. And it seems like we've kind of gone back a little bit. So I um, was glad when Elise invited me to, to moderate this panel. So without any further ado, I will introduce Peter Chen um, from the Advocates for Children in New Jersey. And he will talk a little about birth to five. Peter. Hi, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> How you doing, Terrell? Uh, so I have slides, but I'm pretty much going to go off script because it's the last panel of the day, so you don't want to see me read slides. You have the presentation, you can read it. You know. um, but uh, so I'm just going to start with a little bit of an overview. We've already seen a lot about this. OK, uh, light exposure obviously manifests dif differently in kids. So really, there, when we talk about educational interventions or policy shifts, there's no silver bullet. OK, kids are affected differently by lead, so you're there's, there's no perfect solution here. Um, and what we have is a lot, of, a lot of tools at our disposal that need to be tailored to individual children and also that can be designed for whole populations. But this is not, there's, there's no one solution here. And the other thing I want to say here is, you know, we're on, on here as a sort of policy panel. Uh, something my tax professor liked to say is that there's no such thing as a loophole, okay? It's not a loophole, somebody put it there for a reason. Okay, so this is not a public policy failure. Uh, that is to say, let the failure of you know, having interventions for kids who've been light exposed and the continued light exposure of kids. This is a public policy decision that we've made as a country and as a society. And in order to get the kind of changes we're gonna need, everything that everyone talked about in here today is gonna cost money. Some of that, that money's gotta come from somewhere and we have to be really mindful about how we're going to organize to make this not only a dollars and cents issue, but also uh, you know, a moral issue. So just keep that in mind as we talk today. We're gonna go through a lot of legal sort of pieces that can, and legal tools that can be used to help kids who've been light exposed. But the bottom line here is, this is a public policy decision and we all need to be thinking about how to strategically go forward and make sure the resources are there to address these public policy issues. So, um, the, lo the good thing here is we have some solutions, right? We know about high quality early childhood experiences. We know about um, a variety of interventions that exist for children who have disabilities or developmental delays. Um, and we also know that a stronger link between healthcare and education is gonna be more helpful. Okay, um, so there are a variety of programs that are out there. Uh, I'm gonna talk mostly about uh, infancy and early childhood, uh, early intervention, head early Head Start, Head Start, preschool, et cetera. Um, so early intervention is run in most states by the Department of Health, some states as Department of Education. Uh, this is in-home services to children with disabilities or developmental delay, and there are eligibility criteria. You have to have a certain amount of disability. Um, you have to have a certain number of standard deviations or uh, percent away from what's described as normal development. Um, so again, one thing I want to make clear here is that early intervention can help, but we don't have concrete evidence about specifically early intervention for children who've been light exposed. We have information about early intervention for children with developmental delays and disabilities generally, but it's not, a, um, we, we don't have exact data on this. Um, now, one thing that I do want to point out is that, as has been mentioned earlier, children have, uh, children can have longer term uh, symptoms that develop as a result of their lead exposure that do not show up in the zero to three range. So one thing that a number of states have done is uh, include lead poisoning as essentially a condition that automatically gets you a referral to EI. Michigan, for example, is one of these states. I will say, though, that most of these states don't actually follow through on that mandate. That is to say, if you have a kid who has a high level of uh, may have an elevated blood lead level, they may not actually get referred and there's no 
There's no real mechanism in place to make sure that that referral takes place. They can just give mom a phone number and say, call this number, and if mom doesn't do it, that's it. That's the end of the line. Um, one thing I want to point out is that this is a pervasive issue. You guys in the room already know this, but uh, I don't know if you can see this graph at all. But each of these lines is, uh, so the purple line in the middle, that's percentage of kids screened in New Jersey. Uh, this is under age six. So it's in the, you know, uh, this is in any given year. Uh, so about 26% of all kids in New Jersey each year under the age of six get screened for uh, blood blood tests. Now you see the blue line at the bottom that's going down. Uh, that's uh, above 10 uh, micrograms per deciliter. The red dotted line, that's between 5 and 10. But the thing that I want you to pay attention to is the green line that's up there at 19%. Okay? That is a 3 to 4, greater than 3 to 4 micrograms. Uh, so greater than 3 micrograms per deciliter. So this is not, no action is triggered by the government in the 3 to 4 range. But these are kids who have definitely been light exposed. And that's 20% of the kids in the state who've been screened. So that's a lot. Uh, and that is the population that you know, we're, we're need, we need to be thinking about interventions for in the educational space. Um, OK, so policy thanks for early intervention. Um, kids with elevated blood level, lead levels should be referred to EI. Um, this is a, as a, as a precautionary measure. You know, early intervention does not necessarily, the, the definition for the presumptive condition in early intervention uh, is children who've exposed to like toxic substances and notes fetal alcohol syndrome. It does not mention lead poisoning specifically. But I think for a lot of kids who are in this category, um, they, they may be eligible and kids should be referred and this is a, a definitely a risk factor. Um, I mentioned states with, high, uh, with presumptive conditions and also we talked a lot about protective environments. Better nutrition, high quality childhood environment, uh, early childhood environments. These are things that we can put in place and they are doable. They are just expensive, right? Someone's got to pay for it. Um, so one thing I want to say is I think the panel works better if we talk throughout because otherwise I'm just going to stand up here. So if you have questions, you should just, I don't know, yell them or something. Yes. So I would say that, you know, we, we should have universal high quality early childhood for everybody, but uh, we, you know, it's not that we're in a zero sum world necessarily, but uh, at a certain point we are talking about a limited pot of resources um, and higher risk kids, we should make sure that they have access to these resources. So something to think about is early Head Start versus head, I, many, even though you're supposed to have 100% of your Head Start slots filled, many of them are not. Uh, I think states should really be thoughtful about converting Head Start slots to early Head Start slots. Families need infant toddler care and the capacity is not there in the centers. So that's something to think about. Um, and you know, I think targeting has, uh, I think making sure, especially on the disability services side, that children are who, are, who we know are at risk, are screened and are referred to services, that's really important. Because there are resources out there. I mean, Jenny's gonna talk more about sort of Part B and special ed in school age children, but there are resources here too, and the child find responsibility is not as high in the early years as it is once the kids hit school age. Because the state just does not interact with kids on as regular a basis. So uh, I am aware, for example, of no litigation on the question of whether or not a state has failed in its child find responsibility for infants and toddlers, except in rare cases where, for example, a child had a specific condition that was identified by the state and then not followed upon, like a birth condition. So states can define their eligibility categories as they see fit. So for example, Michigan just decided if you live in a Flint zip code, if you were born and live in a Flint zip code and you're under the age of three, you're presumptively eligible for early intervention. Okay, so states can do this. In certain states, about, I want to say, seven or eight states have at-risk categories. 
Massachusetts, Rhode Island, they have, you know, if you have a certain number, four out of eight check boxes filled, um, low APGAR score or, um, you know, uh, other, other children in the home who have disabilities, then you get flagged and you can become eligible by that alone. In New Jersey, uh, you almost always have to meet, either have to be in a specific condition category, like autism spectrum, cerebral palsy, or you have to have a delay of a certain amount. Now, evaluation teams have discretion to admit kids, but on the whole, I'd say that's, that's the case. Okay, yes? So the statute in New Jersey could be passed. That, that led to level five. That's right. But, yeah, I mean, that, you could absolutely do it. A number of states have this kind of thing on the books. But one thing I would caution is you got to make sure that these things are enforced. New Jersey has great sets of mandates on the book for a lot of different issues regarding lead poisoning. You know, housing has to be tested when it gets transferred, and you have to have inspections, and you have to have, you know, all kids are supposed to get tested. It doesn't always happen, right? Unless you really have a mechanism in place to make sure that there's, one, funding for this stuff, and two, a strong referral system that's going to ensure that all the kids in pot A get referred to pot B is not going to happen. Well, so, first, the well, I mean, I, I think they've got to come together, right? That is to say, if you're going to pass something that says you're going to have lead, blood lead, elevated blood lead test be a presumptive category, you've got to have the funding behind it because early intervention, states are not required to provide any dollars towards their early intervention program. Okay? They, they do not need to provide any dollars. So if you're not providing more dollars to your early intervention program, and then you're saying, we're expanding the eligibility category, you're going to get lower quality services, you're going to get, uh, and they're going to raise the eligibility categories elsewhere. So you know, it is, it, like I said at the beginning, this is a policy question, this is a political question. So you know, we can have solutions, but we've got to figure out how to pay for them. Yes? That's, that's right. Um, the only thing is for, that for lead poisoning in particular and for all manner of exposure to chemical um, or poison substances, these things are going to manifest in different ways. Many times kids are going to need surveillance to see that when something pops up that they are automatically referred. They, and this is why something like the presumptive eligibility it can be helpful when you're talking about kids who are, uh, because we know that high quality environments matter, right? And if we can get these kids into high quality environments, we, we know that it's going to have some impact on them. Yes? Uh, you're talking about the funding for early intervention, intervention and earlier we heard about uh, the possibility of lead uh, poisoned children turning into bad behavior and criminals. Um, I would think that tying early intervention funding into criminal justice which is a much more likely topic to get funding for would be beneficial. So I, I would say two things on this point. One is that this strategy has been, we've, we've been trying nationally on uh, early childhood and trying to get more preschool funding based on this sort of uh, argument. And I don't know how effective it's been because, one, it reinforces the idea that, quote, these kids, unquote, are destined for crime and poverty unless we do something about it. Uh, and that's a sort of harmful, uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily help make the argument. And two, the costs come too far, the, the benefits come too far down the road. So when you say, oh, we're going to reduce juvenile justice and criminal uh, prison spending, the guy in office now doesn't care because they're not going to be there in 18 years. So I, I agree with you that that's a, a useful frame in some arguments, but I also would caution that we have to think about making the argument for it being necessary now, not just who's going to pay for it in 18 years. Because arguments about who's going to pay for something in 18 years, I don't know if you've seen New Jersey state deficit lately, doesn't matter a whole lot. OK. Um, so uh, also, people mentioned early Head Start. So you know, for kids who don't qualify for early intervention, early Head Start is a good option. States have very limited slots. Um, and Head Start programs aren't necessarily going to know if a kid has had an elevated blood blood level. Okay, so one of the issues that we're, I think all three of us are going to mention is that there's a problem with, we, we rely on the parent to transfer all of the information from the healthcare system to the education system. 
you get information from your doctor and you're supposed to give that information to the school. So when a child enrolls in Head Start, they're supposed to say, has the child been, had, had a blood lead test? Was that test elevated? If mom doesn't check the box, the school's never going to know, um, unless it's disclosed at some other time. And there are good reasons for that. Uh, I think Jenny's going to talk more about HIPAA and FERPA, but these are, that's a reality that makes it difficult to make that connection. So early Head Start is helpful, but again, the warm handoff is key with early Head Start. Okay, we talked about universal preschool. It's great. We think it's high quality preschool can be a protective factor for a lot of developmental uh, delays and conditions, but uh, kids with lead exposure are going to need different supports. And we heard a little bit about it. We don't have great science on exactly what works for kids who are lead exposed because their symptoms vary in a lot of different ways. But it is clear that universal preschool can be helpful for kids with developmental delays generally in reducing their um, uh, how far behind they are academically. OK, I'm going to talk a little bit about preschool special education. Um, so this is part B, the same section, the same piece as all of special ed for K through 12, except it's a specific section called 619. We won't get into the technical bits of it. But suffice to say, there are different eligibility requirements for preschool than there are for preschool special education than there are for six, uh, than K-12. Um, so there, this is, it's, so the health impairment such as lead poisoning only makes a child eligible if it adversely affects learning or development. Okay, so um, we know that kids who participate do end up with higher IQ scores, increased language development, and that all districts, as far as I know, uh, provide our, our participants in the, the Part B 619 system. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a tricky issue because eligibility is not clear. It's the same thing with EI. The child may be asymptomatic. Uh, and as uh, Ted was saying before, you know, a child may have an IQ that's above 100, seems to be normally developing, but may have, uh, you know, may have deficits in certain areas that are not picked up by the school's evaluation. So you know, I think we really have to think about this in terms of all of the different potential layers of supports that could help a child and see whether or not they apply for that child. Preschool special ed, is there a district with universal preschool? Or is there at-risk preschool? Because certain districts have at-risk preschool. Is there a Head Start? Um, something we should all think about is expanding preschool. I know, you know there's a lot of debate about, do you want to do it universally? Do you want to do it for specific populations? Do you want half day? Do you want full day? But more preschool would be better, I think, is the general piece on that. Um, OK, thoughts on preschool before I move on? Anyway. OK. Um, Oh, and one more thing is, that it, it's really about making these sort of weak link connections at the local level, too. We got to make sure that from the healthcare community, there really is a warm handoff if there's a referral to early Head Start, preschool, et cetera. If there's not, the school's just not going to know that the child has been lead exposed at all. Um, and schools you know, don't have, necessarily have lots of training on what to do about a child who's been lead exposed. We see some of this in uh, the early childhood school discipline stuff, which is, um, you know, we're talking about suspending, expelling kids in, you know, early childhood settings. Uh, you know, schools are not necessarily set up right now, to, or they're not uh, trained well enough or have enough information to really make sure that they're meeting the needs of the kids. Okay, um, the school health link is really a, a final piece that I'll talk about. Um, on the healthcare side, there's no follow-up with the education system is, as a general rule. Uh, there are healthcare providers, obviously, uh, uh, there, that are more integrated. Um, but the point is that usually, if there's a prescription or there's a, the information is given to the parent, that's the end of the line. Uh, similarly, on the education side, the school doesn't get any information about the child's health other than what the parent gives them. Um, and it's in the stack of, I mean, you guys with kids, you know you get a giant stack of paperwork to fill out on child enrolled in school. Just one more piece of paper, and then that's the end of the line there. Uh, so HIPAA uh, and FERPA are obstacles to getting that information passed back and forth. But there are ways to uh, address that issue. Um, Jane will talk more about that. And then um, one other thing to think about is trying to get sort of educational approaches that are not special ed, but that, are, um, that can be helpful for kids who've been lead exposed. But again, that relies on knowing whether or not kids have been lead exposed, which we don't necessarily have. Um, question on this piece. Yes? Well, uh, I think the formation of local uh, lead prevention coalitions 
will address that disconnect between education and healthcare. I think Dr. Steve spoke to that in Rochester. I'm involved in cities like Newburgh and Utica, where we're doing the same thing. So we're trying to break down those silos so that education is spoken to healthcare. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's an essential piece. Um, and making sure that we have those links built. Uh, unfortunately, what we've seen is that those links are usually, it's piecemeal. You know, it's a city here, it's a city there. We don't have an integrated system and we don't even have like uh, a model of say, let's say um, an MOU between a district and a local health agency to make sure to see whether some limited information sharing can happen within the, the restrictions of the confidentiality laws. So I think there are big steps to take there, but again, it requires everyone's doing their own thing and trying to uh, get everyone to take action is uh, sort of a key step, even when everyone is generally moving towards the same goal. So it's great the work that's being done in Utica and Rochester and elsewhere, Rhode Island, um, but you know, we, we, we've got to do more. Yes? So I, I think parent, uh, um, engaging parents and empowering parents is an important step. Uh, and I, the, the only thing I'll say is that it's hard when you're in that position as a parent. You know, you've just found out that your child has, and the things that we talk about with lead poisonings, it's an irreversible brain damage. I think it's hard for, and especially when we're talking about low-income parents, parents who have maybe single parents, they have two jobs, trying to put the, pre put, put the responsibility on parents to say, you know, you take this on, I think that's, uh, I don't know how far that necessarily gets us. I think it's an important part of the solution, um, but as a policy matter, uh, it's, I mean, I, I don't know necessarily, I mean, I, I agree that it's important, and you know, we've, I mean, at least, I've done work, you know, training parents on early intervention um, and knowing your rights and trying to empower parents there. But I also think that it's a, it, it requires a culture shift and that's something that we're, we all have to work on. Uh, I saw a hand here, yeah. I just wanted to speak a little bit on Head Start and Early Head Start because I've worked for Early Head Start and Head Start for 10 years and it's actually a requirement in our standards to follow up on the children. We do a health history when they come in and we make sure we follow New Jersey at 12 and 24 months. So we're doing that communication with the doctor's office, bypass, not bypassing HIPAA, but we have a release of records that we go through. And even speaking with the parents, I just want to give a little bit of hope. Um, across the board, we're doing this in all our Head Start regions, where we're doing parent education, making them aware, working with our health departments. So when you guys talk about collaboratives, it really is, it is important. And I see the difference that it's making in the communities. Um, in all those areas. So health isn't talking to us, but health at the school level, um, being a health manager, we reach out to the doctor's office um, and promoting all that information getting across as early as you know our 12, starting at our 12 months, and making sure that we follow through and teach parents to continue to follow through with ask questions and be compliant with those tests. Yeah, I, I don't want to be a downer. I'm just saying, I'm just saying it's hard. Um, and, and one thing that we see is unlike vaccinations, okay, with vaccinations, the kid's not vaccinated, they're not getting into school, right? But lead poisoning is not contagious, right? So there's no, and we want the kids to be in the school. We'd rather them be in the school than not. Um, but the, the challenge then becomes one of communication, education, and taking the time on the part of the, you know, on the, the Head Start contractor to really go out and do some of that outreach. Um, and, you know, you guys have a lot of things to do. <laughs> Run Head Start and early Head Start centers isn't easy. Um, so I think it, we, we do need to think about this as a systemic issue and not just, you know, let's, let's focus on our one thing. Okay, uh, one and then two. Yeah, you. Yeah. So, you know, EPSCT and Medicaid regs are a thicket, um, but I do think that one of the things we've seen, Ohio is a good example as a state that's been using EPSCT to cover follow-up services from preliminary blood lead level screenings. And they have, the more that something is a health service, the more it's more, more likely to be covered. So something like a neuropsychological, um, so if, for example, a health department decides that as part of its case management, they're gonna include a neuropsychological exam as part of the follow-up, 
um, you can imagine that we could work with Medicaid and insurers to try to ensure that that's reimbursable. Um, I think that's definitely a strategy that could work. I do think, though, that um, in most states, Medicaid dollars are uh, a limited pot, and you do have to really um, demonstrate the benefit in the relatively short term for these tests. Um, and I, I'm not sure, I think the best way to package it is as part of the case management and essentially subcontract it out after that. But I think it's tricky. Um, I don't have a, a great answer on that, but I, I will say that we do need to think creatively about how to use EPSDT, especially on the follow-up end. Because one of the things that we've been we've sort of talked around is primary prevention, right? If we're not getting the lead out of homes. Uh, kids are just going to keep getting re-exposed and re-exposed. Um, and so there's some flexibility with an EPSDT to at least cover educational stuff to, to supplant some of the funds that might otherwise go into inspections and uh, remediation. So something to think about there. Yes, question up there. Um, so FQHCs are, you know, an important partner, but I also would say that they're not, you know, again, there's no silver bullet here, right? They, they can only, uh, what we've seen FQHCs are not getting at uh, the percentage of population that they were originally hoping to, um, to treat. Um, and at least public education through FQHCs can be tricky because you want to show up and you've got your health screening and you want to get out of there. You don't necessarily want to sit around for a half hour, you know, session on, I mean, uh, I, I think it's doable, but I think, again, it's, this is about a community effort and making sure everyone's sort of part of that solution. I've gone way over time, I'm way sure. Over. Yeah? yeah um, <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, next, I have the pleasure of introducing Jennifer Rosen Valverde. Um, she told me she's the original Jenny from the block. Um, so. <laughs> I don't know what Jay Lowe has on her, so, but um, <laughs> Jay Rowe, that's right, Jay Rowe. Always need a little comedy at times like this. Um, hi, everybody. So um, I think perhaps in retrospect, uh, we, we should have put the lawyers up front because we tend to be a pessimistic lot and not always <laughs> the greatest people to end with. But um, I, I will try to keep it uh, on the positive side. Um, so that being said, I'm going to tell a very sad story. And then I will move on to talk about how the laws are really not very helpful in many ways, A, because they, they provide uh, oftentimes many more obstacles uh, than they, um, rather than promoting rights. And, uh, and then I will hopefully, though, end on a positive note with a program that we are running that is a collaborative program that bridges all the different silos and is working really hard to address some of these issues. So. Um, to start with the sad story, uh, you, you know, when cases get to me um, in our education and health law clinic, it's, it's usually well point past the point of time that, that they should have been addressed. Uh, I've been teaching there and representing low-income and indigent families for over 15 years uh, in special education uh, matters. Before that, I worked um, on early intervention matters in Chicago. Um, you, you know, the kinds of cases that we get, we get the phone call from the hospital from one of the doctors telling us, oh, we have a child who's inpatient again. This is her third inpatient visit. She's two and a half years old. Um, and her lead level is over 100. Or we have the 17-year-old who um, came in and was really having some very bad physical manifestations of lead exposure, or lead poisoning, rather. And uh, it turns out he works part-time at a gun range. And he didn't realize the importance of washing his clothes immediately after kind of going around and, and cleaning up after people. So those are the types of cases that we see when it comes to lead. I will tell you that, you know, in all my years of, of working in Newark and the surrounding community, I am sure that there are many, many, many children who have experienced lead poisoning or, or at the very least lead exposure, if not all of those children at some point in time. Um, but we often don't know about it. And why don't we know about it there? It's because, number one, we have um, our undocumented population, and our undocumented kids cannot get preventive care. So we only hear about them when they are admitted inpatient with the ridiculously high um, lead toxicity. 
we don't hear about it because we have um, children who are highly mobile. So they're moving from one home to the next. They are often changing their primary care provider as a result. So you know, a lot of, a lot of our families don't use the bigger institutions. They have small pediatric practices that they, they get their primary care from. And when they move from one town to the next, they keep shifting that care. We have a situation where even our larger, uh, you know, I work with, in Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, we have office space on the pediatrics clinic. They still don't have an electronic medical record system. So these records are not following children, even from doctor to doctor. So the whole idea that we would expect those records to actually make it into schools um, is, is a huge feat that I think we need to accomplish. Um, another issue is, um, you know, just lack of information. And I speak of lack of information really in reference to what happened last year. I'm sure all of you are aware of what happened with the Newark uh, and the public schools water scare. And so it was found that there, there were some very, very high levels um, in the water being tested at Newark public schools, that they knew about it for a while, that it was not shared. Um, and, and certainly David's going to talk um, more about that and how that relates to the Flint case. But what I will tell you is that there was not enough information shared with the families afterwards. What did we see on um, Mayor Baraka's City of Newark website? A big headline that said, all Newark water is safe. Now I see that and I don't think to ask questions. I say, okay, I guess everything's okay. What they meant was that Newark water at its source was safe. They have no idea, and now you've seen what happens when the water travels through the pipes. And it travels through the pipes into the homes, and into the pipes at the schools, and the pipes to the daycare centers. Um, no one has any idea as to whether or not that water is safe. And then on top of that, we have, you know, uh, the, the, the paint, you know, is a whole other issue. So the lead paint chips and the ingestion of them, the toys and other things that were discussed here already. So there is a lack of information. The other uh, big piece of missing information when it came to the Newark Public Schools was um, something that um, uh, Mona only mentioned briefly. And, uh, and she mentioned briefly the half-life of lead. And I just want to clarify what that is because it's a very important concept. Half-life of lead, what that refers to is how long your lead level stays at a certain level in the bloodstream. So you could ingest a highly toxic amount of lead and on that particular day, or perhaps the next day, test the lead level of 60, 70, 90, 100. However, every 30 days, because of the short half-life of lead, that lead number will reduce by one half. So when we think in New Jersey about the fact that we have the testing every 12 months and every 24 months, it could very well be that a child had some sort of limited exposure at a certain point in time but then no longer was subjected to that exposure. Perhaps they moved homes. Perhaps they changed daycares. And then by the time the next testing comes around, they no longer are showing any sort of positive uh, lead levels in their blood. So another issue that we had was, you know, why are you not telling all those families to go out there and get tested quickly? But they didn't. And in reality, I don't, I don't know the number offhand, but I can tell you within three weeks of setting up those testing sites, I think it was only 65 kids who had actually gone and gotten tested when they were recommending that more than 17,000 children get the testing. So somewhere, somehow, there was a tremendous breakdown in information. So to me, this problem is far more than just simply one about education law and policy. It is one about looking at all of our laws and policies and looking at how they affect lead directly as well as indirectly. And what do I mean by indirectly? I mean something like the nutrition program. If we know full well that high fat foods make you absorb lead more easily into the bloodstream, then shouldn't we be targeting the school lunch programs and the school breakfast programs? Because I will tell you in Newark, that's where more than 70% of our children get fed. So, you know, we can't just be talking about, you know, what, what can the schools do or what can we do with respect to the housing? We have to start looking at everything together and sitting down together. And there I really harken on a concept that, that we call preventive law. So just like doctors are out there trying to practice preventive medicine, I am a firm believer that we need to practice preventive law. And rather than addressing problems after they've become legal problems, when, they, when we know that they are far harder to address, we need to take a, take a step back 
partnering with our doctors, our public health officials, our social workers, our educators, to figure out what the conditions are that can arise in problems and addressing them then. So with that being said, I'm going to move on um, and talk. Oh, and I didn't even put my PowerPoint up. Yeah, could you please? <laughs> oh, no, that's OK. I got to roll, so. Um, okay. So you know, what I'm going to cover are just a couple of the primary education laws that um, I think do touch on the lead issues. But as I said, I think we need to start uh, really moving far beyond education. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is um, IDEA Part B. And that's the um, federal special education law that governs uh, children ages 3 to 21. Um, so I give you sites. I'm not going to bother going through sites. OK, so what does the law say? This is what you need to know. The law says that every child with a disability has the right to a free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. What we're going to do is take just a couple minutes to break that down and figure out what does each piece of that actually mean. So first we have to define what is a child with a disability. A child with a disability is a child who has a physical, emotional, learning, or cognitive disability who, because of that condition, needs special education and related services. This is a really important definition. It's not just simply, I have a disability, therefore I get special education. It leads into a three-part eligibility test for special education. And I really want to highlight that, and we're going to go through the test in a moment, because this morning there were a couple of references made to, well, we need to really look at special education law. The reality is, for a lot of children who have been exposed to lead, special education law will not apply, or it will not apply until it is too late. What is special education? For those of you who don't know, it's specially designed instruction. It is individualized instruction to address a child's unique needs. So earlier we were talking about the fact that for children who are exposed to lead, they're all, it affects every child's brain differently. So the federal special education law really is geared towards that. The whole idea is to identify children who have disabilities and then to individually tailor the program to meet that particular child's needs. It includes instruction in home, hospitals, institutions, detention. I highlight hospitals. So if you have a child who's you know, experienced lead poisoning, it doesn't mean, oh, school stops while well, I sit here in the hospital for you know, a month and a half. No, school needs to continue. There are protections in the law to make sure that the school continues. The instruction for special education is also not limited to academics. Too often, we've, we've heard a lot talked about the IQ testing. IQ testing doesn't matter, OK? It's only one small piece of a puzzle. And if any school district is weighing its, its entire case as to why a child is eligible is based on the IQ test, they are wrong. You have to look at all the different areas of learning. And by that, I don't just mean academics. I don't just mean cognition. I mean behavior. I mean social emotional skills. I mean adaptive skills, daily living skills, communication skills. Um, all of those are part of education. So in special education, one of the plus sides is we define education very broadly. What is a free and appropriate public education? That's what children who meet that definition are eligible for. Well, their education has to be free. Can't pay any more than any other child has to pay. Appropriate. Appropriate does not mean the best. It's not the Cadillac, it's the Chevy. That's the, you know, 19, whatever, when did Rally come out? 1980, 1980, So they were talking Cadillacs and Chevys then. Um, so you don't get the Cadillac, you just get the Chevy. So you get the minimum, not the maximum. And this goes back to what Peter was saying about money. We don't think about investment for the future. We think about what is the money we have to pay for things here and now. So that's what states are looking at, that's what the federal government is looking at, and that's what school districts are looking at. So they're going to give you the minimum that they can give you in most instances, not because teachers are evil. I love teachers. I used to be a teacher. I was also a school social worker. Teachers don't get into teaching if they don't care about children, right? The problem is, is that when you're dealing with a board of ed that has a certain funding structure where they have a limited amount of dollars, Regardless of how much you care and how much you want to do, it comes down to money. The other issue about appropriate is, you know, so does it mean 
meaningful progress or some progress. So we're looking at how is the child going to progress. That's going to be an interesting issue over the next year just because it's going before the US Supreme Court. Um, the school district has to be a public school district. It applies to public school districts, including charter schools. Charter schools are equally responsible to provide special education services to children, as are the regular public school districts. And as I said before, education is defined broadly. Child find. We talked really briefly about child find, and this is where you know I try to bring it back down to what we're talking about today with respect to lead. So there's an affirmative duty of states to go out there to locate, identify, and evaluate potentially eligible children. However, when we don't know what potentially eligible children means, it becomes a very difficult process. So when we have varying CDC levels about, well, you know, if, if we have a lead level of more than 10, we have to worry. Or is it a lead level of more than five? Or is it, you know, just a lead level of two? At what point in time do we have to be concerned? The other issue is that um, special education ages 5 to 21 is very different from the 0 to 5 age group in terms of eligibility. We don't have presumptive eligibility categories. We have no category that says, oh, if your child has been diagnosed with X, your child will automatically get special education. That is not how the special education system works. Instead, we have a three-part test, and forgive my typo. Number one, does the child have a disability? Number two, does the disability adversely affect the child's educational performance? And then number three, such that does the child need special education services? If we don't answer yes to all three, that child will not be eligible. So when we think about the lag time, just because a child tests at a high lead level, even if it were 50 tomorrow, that will not automatically make that child eligible for special education. You have to show that it's somehow adversely affecting some aspect of their education. And because we know that that might not come out till years later, we might not get any services from special education until years later. Is that clear for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you compare a neuropsychological assessment that shows that there is uh, some deficit in cognitive or uh, memory or some part of the brain has been affected by the lead or something else? Mm -hmm. Is that not? The problem is, um, and I, I have to disagree with Peter, I don't think you'll ever get neuropsychological testing by Medicaid or by any other health insurance because neuropsychological testing is typically considered educational testing, not medical or health testing. Number two, it is extraordinarily expensive, costing upwards of $5,000 per <coughs> examination. Number three, no school district will ever, ever, ever pay for it willingly without you suing them in New Jersey. That's the problem. So while we would love to hang our hat, and again, I said, you know, lawyers are a pessimistic bunch. That's, um, that's based on experience, representing your kids for years. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult to get that type of thing. Um, I think if you showed that a child had extremely high levels, and then you saw already signs of it affecting their education at school, then you can make a good argument to get it paid for, but it's not a guarantee. So with respect to if a child was lead exposed or poisoned, you still have to ask, does the child have a disability? Lead exposure, lead poisoning, that is not in and of itself a disability. Does the disability adversely affect the educational performance and does the child then need special education? Now, where might a child fit in the special education classifications? There's 14 areas of uh, disability kind of classification to make a child eligible. The one that I highlighted there is other health impaired because the other health impaired definition actually talks about lead poisoning, not lead exposure, lead poisoning. But again, it has to, and I highlight again, adversely affect the student's educational performance. And you have to bring in medical assessment documenting <coughs> that there was um, that problem, that the lead poisoning occurred. Are there other categories of eligibility that a child could fit under? Sure, because we know now that children who have been exposed to lead or lead poison can present with behavioral problems, with communication impairments, with um, multiple disabilities, with um, specific learning disabilities in the areas of reading or math or executive functioning. So there are many other areas that the child might be eligible under. It's not just limited to other health impairments. 
Um, however, you have to watch and wait and see when it starts affecting the education. Okay. There's a couple of alternatives. The first alternative is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Is that a five or a three? I'm going. What's that? Five minutes or three? Five. Five. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that I can't see. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so Section 504 is, again, it's another statute that provides uh, educational um, modifications and accommodations to students where they have a disability. It's a broader definition of disability, but there's also fewer protections under it. So it protects a qualified person who has a physical or a mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, like learning, breathing, walking, behaving, communicating, so there are many things that could fit there. But at the same time, we still have to ask, is it substantially limiting that activity? So it's not enough to have an impairment, but it has to limit whatever is the, the mechanism that you're trying to get special education services or educational services from. So does it limit reading? Does it limit communication? Does it limit learning overall? Um, the final possibility is a general ed statute, and this is intervention and referral services. And this might be our best bet for at least the monitoring piece. So these are services for students who present with learning, behavior, health, or other difficulties, regardless if they're in a regular education program or in a special education program. Um, and basically, a student can be referred to what's called the INRS team and get assessed, and then they can put in some interventions in place. Interventions, uh, there's no set test for INRS services. But what I think is the most logical thing that they will look at is does the child have some sort of difficulty and is it negatively affecting the child at school? Somehow negatively affecting the child's education. And examples of services, tutoring, remedial programs, behavioral interventions, could enrichment be part of that? Absolutely. Could a, a additional assessments be part of that? Certainly. But again, only a small portion of school district's budgets typically are allocated towards intervention and referral services. So, you know, and could monitoring be a part of their work? Yes. But the monitoring really only comes into play when we start talking about HIPAA. HIPAA is what everybody is looking out there and saying this is this immense barrier to sharing of information. Well, HIPAA is only a barrier if a parent refuses consent. If a parent says to a doctor, here, I'll give you written consent to share my child's love level with my school. Guess what? It's shared. It's done. So what we need to start doing is stop blaming you know, these, these large federal laws as obstacles and instead say, you know what, maybe we need to there instead target the healthcare workers and talk to them about what types of questions are you asking. This is something that we do in um, Heal Collaborative, the program that I direct, where we are up at the pediatric clinic at um, Rutgers New Jersey Medical School where they see 25, they have 25,000 patient visits per year, 70% are Medicaid. We work all the time with the doctors and the residents on training them to screen for social determinants. One of the social determinants is housing. Don't just ask, do you have concerns about housing? Say, are there paint chips? Is there dust coming off the windowsills? Is your child eating things? You know, ask specific questions to do better screening to see should we be doing the lead testing. And then if there's a positive, building into their practice an automatic question of, can I share this information with your school district? Because if the parent signs yes, that's it. It's done. It can be shared. There is a risk, though, and I think it's always important to talk about the risk. Some parents will say no, and they will say no not because they want their child harmed, but because there is absolutely a stigma associated with disability. And to ignore that is to, is to be blind to do it. Um, many parents with, that we work with um, have experienced uh, growing up in the special education system themselves. And they feel as if they were mistreated as a result of that system. And that there was a self-fulfilling prophecy where people automatically looked at them and said, oh, this is my lead exposed class, so I'm not going to expect much of them. I'm not going to expect that they're going to behave poorly. And I'm going to expect that none of them can pay attention. And automatically, when I see the slightest problem, boom, it's because of lead. That happens. It shouldn't, but it does. And so that's really where parent education comes in and sharing with parents the importance of you know, why it could be helpful to share this information with the school districts. But ultimately, it is the parent decision. And I question taking away that right. 
I'm not sure I as a parent would want, you know, things about my children shared freely with the school district if I didn't have, you know, faith that that school district would use that information properly. So I, I, I do urge people to keep that in consideration. So just very quickly, I'll summarize. Can lead-related health information be shared? Yes, with schools. Yes, with parents. With schools, only if the parent signs consent. But once they sign consent, you are good to go. Um, is lead exposure or poisoning enough to be eligible for special education or 504 services? No. There has to be an effect on education. And then finally, what are some things can do? This is merely repeating much of what has been said today. We need to educate school personnel, educate parents, getting a comprehensive health history from the families to the extent we can get that information, encourage parents to seek testing um, if there is possible lead exposure, monitoring students who we do know have been lead exposed, and abiding by child fine mandates um, under special education regulations when needed. And I will say there is a little bit of hope, and that hope comes in the form of legislation proposed in the state of New Jersey, A159, Assembly Bill A159. Right now it's stuck in committee, but it does uh, really try to start addressing some of the issues regarding lead in the schools, and so I encourage all of you to take a look. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, last, David Scare from the Education Law Center. Uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to, the good news is I'm not going to use a PowerPoint. <laughs> so you're just going to have to listen to me a little bit. Uh, the bad news is it's going to be bad news. <laughs> uh, I don't promise any good news. Uh, we, uh, those of us who know that, what's that? Yeah. Well, those of you that know, um, know us at the Education Law Center, uh, we've been at defending kids' education rights for over 40 years. Uh, we're best known for our role in the Abbott versus Burke case. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so we do a lot of work on school finance, but we also do a lot of litigation on school finance, public school finance, here in New Jersey and in other states, which is a, really a backdrop for a lot of the conversation that we've been having today, the condition of the public financing system, the school financing systems in our states. Uh, but we also do a lot of litigation around special education and other rights for kids. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, what we've been doing, two things, two, uh, two issues uh, where we brought a lot of what you've heard into, uh, into the courts to try to enforce um, rights that are already on the books. And I'm going to talk about the case we just filed in, um, in the Western Dist uh, Eastern District of Michigan Federal Court involving Flint uh, and a lot of the law that um, that uh, Jennifer just took us through, and how does it apply to the situation that uh, Dr. Mona uh, raised with respect to the uh, situation in Flint. Also, I'm going to talk a little bit about the advocacy we're doing on uh, here in Newark uh, and other urban districts around trying to get the lead out of schools and the drinking water in schools. So, um, so we are working at it, beginning to work at it, uh, uh, in the in bringing bringing these issues into the courts. Uh, so, I do want to um, I do want to uh, talk about a few contextual issues, though, before I get started. Um, the special education law, the idea law, and other laws really weren't designed to deal with um, systemic uh, uh, issues around uh, lead poisoning and its effect, learning effects on kids. Um, as Jennifer said, idea is about individuals by individuals. And it really wasn't set up to deal with where communities, there's large numbers of kids in those communities, or a situation like Flint where everybody uh, is exposed and potentially at risk of a disability. So that creates a whole set of, uh, of challenges. And as, we've also, as Jennifer also pointed out, there are some uh, impediments that have to be overcome in these laws, particularly in FER FERPA. Um, but I want to, uh, and the other challenge is, uh, uh, the challenges of lead poisoning itself, and we've been hearing that over and over again, uh, that it isn't easily manifest, it manifests, may it manifest later, it affects kids differently and in different ways at different times um, in terms of their ability to learn and their impact on learning, uh, whether or not it rises to the level of a disability under IDEA. And it also, as we've heard, intersects with other risk factors uh, that 
uh, kids, uh, there's a you know, strong correlation. I mean, Flint is not unusual in the sense that there's a, a strong correlation between lead exposure and communities of color and high poverty communities and school districts that serve large concentrations, uh, as the superintendent's district does, of children who are poor and living in poor neighborhoods. And so you have uh, the risk factors that schools are dealing with and the education systems are dealing with as a result of racial, iso racial isolation, the lack of diversity in the schools, and also the poverty concentrations and the demand for student need on those schools. Um, the other factor, which is what we work a lot on, is that most of the, a lot of these school systems, we have to face it, are severely under-resourced. Um, you know, this has to do with a lot about the disparity in resources in states and funding disparities in state systems. Uh, Pennsylvania is a good example of that. Big disparities in the availability of funding for high poverty districts versus more affluent districts. And that really impacts a lot of what we're talking about today because I think everybody up here has mentioned money, it costs money. You don't have the money, you can't do it. So we have to recognize that a lot of the school districts we're talking about here that we're asking to deal with this problem are under-resourced to begin with to deal with the basic problems that they have, let alone bring additional resources into deal with a problem such as this. So we have to be very, very sober and realistic about the context in which we're asked the schools are uh, in terms of their funding, their resources, their capacity, and what we're asking them to do. Um, the disconnect with schools, with schools and other systems, we've talked a lot about that. That's a serious problem everywhere. And the absence of universal preschool in the United States, you know, if we were in Europe, this wouldn't be a problem. All kids in most of the Europe, in virtually all the European countries have access to preschool starting at three. Um, the United States is one of pro probably the only undeveloped country where we don't have that for everybody. And the absence of ha having kids in a school setting starting at three is a huge impediment as we're learning to dealing with this problem early. Everybody has talked about we need universal preschool. Well, we need universal preschool for lots and lots of reasons. Um, and it's a big problem in dealing with uh, this issue is that we don't have, uh, even in high poverty communities across the country where we should have it, uh, we do not have uh, 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 all three and four year olds, regardless of income, regardless of need, in a well planned, high quality preschool program that serves their needs. That's a huge problem. We'll under, underscore that. Uh, and lastly, we even have buildings themselves that pose a threat to kids. Uh, so we have school buildings themselves that are not safe and that are not safe not only for the, kid, for the kids who go to the schools, but also for the faculty and support staff that work in them. Uh, which is really a disgrace. Somebody talked about a disgrace earlier. Um, the very schools that we're asking to respond to this problem may also pose a hazard uh, to, the, to the kids and the faculty that are in them um, by exposing them either through the water system or in other ways as we've heard today. So I, um, I, I do want to uh, start out with uh, laying out those contextual factors that I think we all have to take into account when we're kind of trying to uh, consider what to do about this problem. So I want to talk about the Flint litigation and um, the right to, uh, uh, the, which, in which we're using IDEA. Uh, Jennifer laid it all out. And I'm going to give you a real life problem that we're working on um, in Flint. Uh, you know, the, the problem in Flint is, and Dr. Mona was talking about it, is what happens when you, when the state of Michigan, the state itself, consciously and willfully exposed an entire school age population to elevated levels of lead over an extended period of time? Now, how somebody hasn't been locked up for that, talk about locking people up, is beyond me. I mean, this was a, a, an act that just goes beyond uh, uh, anything that we have seen. And so the issue that we were asked to deal with, the ACLU of Michigan, our partner, brought us in to work with them. We brought a big law firm in, White and Case, one of the associates is here, Pauline, uh, is working on this case, young, young lawyers are working on the case. Uh, we put together a team and we started to think about, well, how do we use IDEA to deal with a situation where literally every single child, uh, 0 to 21, 
that's covered under idea, uh, potentially covered under idea, um, uh, how do you do, and, and are, are, are at risk of a disability because being ex, of being exposed to a condition that's an other health impairment, as Jennifer pointed out, under the ideal law. So we need your help. Because one of the things I'm learning about as I've gotten into this is the state of the research in this area is really weak. Uh, we've been hearing about it all day in terms of what, what you do, what the response is, what the appropriate responses are, screening methods that, aren't, that don't cost $5,000 per kid, but they can at least raise red flags as to whether you want to do additional screening, and then the kinds of interventions that we need to address uh, 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 the issues that kids have. Um, uh, there's a, a real need for um, uh, you know, a serious research effort in this area, and I think we're going to need all of your help to try to figure out how we kind of utilize the law in that Jennifer has talked about to deal with the problem in Flint. I, I also want to mention something that Dr. Mona talked about. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff going on in Flint, but she talked about it. It's all sort of, um, we see this a lot, right? It's not systemic and structural, and it doesn't deal with the rights of kids. So uh, a lot of those, a lot of the initiatives that she talked about, she was very candid about it, are foundation funded, philanthropic funded, grant funded, which, as we know, come and go. This is a, given the nature of um, the effects of lead on kids, this has to be a structural, systemic uh, response that's going to go on in this community, as she rightly talked about, for decades to come. Because they've set off a chain of events that are going to affect the lives of these kids all throughout their uh, uh, school age years and into their adult years that has to be addressed. So let me just talk a little bit about the case, uh, about uh, the case itself um, uh, and what, it, what, we're try what, what we've tried to do here. So we're focusing in on that other health impairment under idea, as Jennifer pointed out, um, at, at the other health impairment that puts kids at risk, uh, that can be a disabling condition or a disability under IDEA uh, consists of lead poisoning. Um, eight th there are 8,000 children that are under the age of five in Flint that have been ex exposed or their mothers may have been exposed when they were, when they, when they were pregnant uh, to, to, uh, uh, as a result of the uh, lead exposure. And they're still being exposed today, as she talked about. Uh, there are 5,400 kids in the Flint community schools, uh, the public school district that serves Flint. Um, and as I've mentioned, all are now at risk, one can argue, uh, given the their exposure to elevated lead over at least 18 months, if not more, um, to, a, dis dis to a, uh, a condition that can lead to a disability as defined by IDEA. A couple of things about Flint public schools that's important to understand. It, is a it was a struggling district before this happened and is a struggling urban district. Um, old buildings, uh, constant budget crisis. The Michigan school finance system is a mess. It's a shambles. It uh, you know, Detroit, if you think about Detroit, right, 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 right close by, is one of the most uh, underfunded, um, under-resourced, challenged school districts in the United States. And Flint isn't that far behind. The state of Michigan's uh, funding is, 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 you know, at the bottom. It's really in bad shape. Um, there's a lot of charter schools, too, that serve Flint. That makes it even more difficult. So the, a lot of kids left the Flint public schools and are now in charter schools. And uh, I'm not going to get into this, but the charter school sector in Michigan is um, uh, uh, not like New Jersey's. We have our own problems. But it's almost completely unregulated. Uh, so. Uh, for-profit charters, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you do about those kids who've been exposed that are now in, not in a school district, as defined under IDEA, but as Jennifer points out, a separate little school, mini school districts all over the place. Um, that's what charter schools are. So you have this decentralization of the delivery of education services in Flint, Flint to compound the problem. And then the absence of preschool, which they're trying to, to address. I mean, Dr. Moan was talking about preschool for four-year-olds. There's a lot of kids who are still not 
um, in uh, preschool in the uh, particularly three-year-olds in, in the community. And then no screening going on, they're starting to do it now, uh, 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 that's connected to schooling and learning impairments. And the last point is that the Flint Public Schools, in terms of its special education delivery, uh, even before this crisis, was, was, uh, had lots and lots of problems. Not just uh, uh, raised by parent complaints, but also by monitoring by the state and the federal government. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a district in terms of child fine that's had problems, least restrictive environment, a lot of putting kids into self-contained classrooms or when they shouldn't be, uh, 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 improper use of discipline uh, to deal with kids with special education, and a whole host of problems in the already existing um, special education system. So what we did is we filed a class action lawsuit. Um, that's the only way around an idea. Usually in idea, you have to go Jennifer knows this because she does this all the time. You have to take each in the parent has to come to her, ask for representation, and then you kind of go through the process individually, individual by individual. You can do class actions if you can, if you have enough uh, parents and kids that show systemic patterns and practice in a district. It's going to be a fight to certify this class, which is all kids, uh, all three and four year old children in the community, plus all kids were in the Flint Public Schools and another intermediate school district called the Genesee Intermediate School District uh, who are uh, eligible, who are uh, in those schools. So that's the class. Uh, we left out the charter schools because then it gets really complicated because we had, we'd have to name all the charter schools as defendants. So uh, we figure we'll get to them later. We'll start with the school districts where most of the kids are um, um, first. Um, the uh, defendants in the case are the state of Michigan, the Michigan Department of Education, and those two school districts. And the plaintiffs are a group of parents and kids who are in the Flint Public Schools and who've had lots of problems in the delivery of special education services to them. Um, so the complaint alleges that all, that these children represent a class of kids uh, who are all at risk of developing a disability or already have a disability. Um, we allege that the, the, the defendants do not provide early screening, time, timely referrals for evaluations under the, for, for the three and, year, three and four year old population to identify the existence of a, of a disability uh, and eligibility for special and special education services, appropriate early intervention services that we've heard about, including universal preschool. And then for the group of kids that are already in the schools, we have to worry about them too, right? So it's not just the kids who are uh, going to go to school, the three and four year olds, but it's also the kids that are already in school have been exposed and they may develop disabilities or if they have a disability, that may change, right? That may be impacted as well. So it's a very complex problem. So with those, with respect to those kids, um, we are basically uh, uh, saying that the, we are, uh, the, the complaint alleges that the uh, Flint community schools are engaging in a pattern and pa practice of systemically failing to provide ongoing screening and timely referrals. That's the child fine piece to evaluate, to evaluate kids to identify the disability um, and that they're engaged in patterns and practice of uh, not providing um, uh, service, uh, proper services in the least restrictive environment uh, and unduly harsh disciplinary practices for kids. Um, so it's um, uh, a pretty, uh, uh, you know, a pretty comprehensive complaint. Um, so uh, I, I do want to say something about the Flint budget too, uh, and this gets to the issue of funding. Um, because of underfunding, so 90% of there are two issues of underfunding. One is that IDEA is chronically underfunded by the federal government. Only 40% of the federal edu uh, special education costs are covered by the federal government, even though schools and districts are mandated to provide all of what you've just heard about. Um, the other problem is if you have an underfunded district like Flint, their budget uh, can't handle the 16% of the kids who are enrolled who are already classified with a disability. So they have a structural $10 million deficit every year where they have to take money out of the general fund 
and transfer it just to kind of keep the ship afloat for the kids that are already classified. So you have to think about what's going to be the impact on the resources in these schools when all of these kids, when ki you know, with the kids that are coming into the school, kids that are already in the school, who begin to start to manifest some of these problems that you talked about. So quickly, I'll just go through the relief that we're asking. Uh, we, want a, a, uh, we want a declaratory judgment from the court that the other health impairments definition under IDEA gives rise to an affirmative duty to conduct testing and enhanced screening for all children age three to five. Now this is where I think the experts, you know, we, we, got, we need your help. So what's a good screening tool that doesn't get us into uh, a, a full-blown child study team evaluation that we could use in a place like Flint to at least start to red flag that we could do for every child and begin to red flag whether they then should be then referred uh, for the kind of neurological testing and the other more comprehensive child study team testing. I don't know if we have that, um, so we need that. That's something that we need to do work on. Um, the other um, uh, issues that we're uh, asking the court to, to order is, um, uh, is to um, uh, identify appropriate mitigation measures, ensure that every school has enough sufficient personnel to evaluate and do the IEPs, um, a, a positive behavioral intervention system uh, to track the academic and behavioral needs of all students, implement a positive school climate project, uh, inform the public of the availability of these services, uh, test the water regularly in the Flint schools. They're still not doing that on a regular basis, if you can imagine. Um, and actually, we're asking for universal preschool as an early intervention service for everybody. Um, so I think it's the first time that anybody's tried to use IDEA to actually get universal preschool for everybody because they're at risk of a disability, of developing a disability, um, because we need to get them in school. Um, so that's uh, Flint. I want to talk just a minute about Newark and the issue of public school buildings. Uh, we've been working on that. You know, there should be no, re there, there, if you're, uh, uh, let me back up. I want to say something about the Abbott Preschool Program for men. We've looked over it. We have every three and four year old child in a well-planned, high quality preschool in our cities, our 31 cities. We're the only place in the country where that has happened. It's because of the Abbott rule. They're either in Head Start, Child Care, or Public School classrooms. So I keep telling the advocates here, Let's get on it. We have, all, we have a, a leg up against everybody else because they're all in school. Now, not everyone, because it's not compulsory, but most of them. So most of the kids in Newark who are three and four are in preschool, full day, full year, the whole nine yards. So we have to take advantage of that from a policy point of view and start to build into the structure of the Abbott program the kinds of things that you were talking about here. We don't have to worry about what Dr. Mohn is worrying about. What we're trying to do in Flint is to get the kids into school so then we can observe them, test them, evaluate them, and do all of that. We have the most at-risk population in New Jersey already in. So those numbers, about 26%, that should go way up if we build into that program structural reforms that require all these preschools that are under State Department of Education supervision to do the kinds of things that we're talking about here. I just have to mention that. So we should be at the cutting edge of the nation on this here in New Jersey. Back to the building issue. So Jennifer talked about it, elevated lead in the buildings. Um, the district's response, like the district in Camden, give them bottled water. They shut all the fountains down in 31 schools shut the sinks down, and, hand, and, and they're on bottled water, basically. Camden's public schools have been on bottled water since, I think, 2000, 2008, 10, somebody know? So, um, here's the, so one of the issues we're now working on with uh, the National Resource Defense Council, and parents actually from the Ironbound section of Newark came to us about this with, was, look, isn't there something we can legally do to force the state or the district to undertake the repairs that are necessary uh, to uh, get the fountains properly running, the sinks properly running, and get off bottled water? And it turns out, because of Abbott also, we have very good law 
about the state's obligation to fund emergent repairs in, in, build, in buildings in the school district, uh, 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 in the um, uh, Newark public schools, or in any of our urban public schools. Uh, and we're now at, uh, on, a, on a campaign that will probably lead to litigation uh, to demand that the state step in uh, and deal with this. Now, I will tell you that one of the issues that we need to get at on this, I, I, this is an area too of remediation of water supply in school buildings where a lot more work needs to be done too because I still am not clear on what the proper remediation procedures are short of, you know, obviously replacing all the pipes. Are there, there's, there, there you know, what can be done in these buildings uh, to make sure that the water supply is safe without knocking the building down or, or doing, you know, extensive capital maintenance repairs. Um, there are things that can be done, filtration and these sorts of things. The response though, and it's the response in Flint, is well they have bottled water so the emergency is over. But we know that's not a sufficient solution. So one of the issues that we're going to be raising with the state is no, bottled water isn't good enough for this situation. You have to step in and do emergency capital maintenance repairs uh, to, to, do, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the, there are the, any pipes are replaced, sinks are replaced, fountains are replaced that might corrode, uh, uh, be corrosive uh, in the water supply, and then filtrations put on, and then lastly, that the maintenance folks, somebody talked about the maintenance folks earlier, are prepared to do regular testing and flushing because you have to, as I think, you have to get these buildings on a regular, these older buildings on a regular, uh, uh, ro uh, rigorous, uh, uh, testing and flushing regime. So we're going to be pressing that issue in court. I would just say for those of you in other states, uh, if, if you have uh, kids going to buildings where they're elevated lead and nothing's being done about it, call us. Because there is no, uh, there is, I have no doubt that we can find uh, a, a legal mechanism to force either the district or the state uh, to address conditions in a building which are a, uh, forget about whether the building is academically adequate to deliver, you know, the program and all that, but where the building is posing a direct threat to the health and safety of the kids who go there and the faculty that teaches there. So uh, there's, there, this is an area where we should, as advocates, uh, not stand around. We can figure out how to do this. There's no question that in Pennsylvania or wherever it is, there are legal tools that we can do to hold states and districts accountable to fix <coughs> To, to fix that. Um, and I think I'm going to... Oh, the last thing I'm going to say is about money. I have to talk about money. We have to, the last thing I'm going to say is we have to have school finance reform in these states. The problem in Michigan isn't going to go away until the Michigan, the state of Michigan adequately funds the Flint public schools, the Detroit public schools, so forth and so on. So, we have to keep in mind the backdrop, and this is the other hat I wear, that all of this does cost money and the kinds of resources that we need in some of these schools to deal with this problem are just not there, let alone the capacity building of the teachers, the administrators, and the faculty, and the social workers, and the nurses that we've been talking about, just to identify the problem and then deal with it. Okay, I'll stop. Yes. Question? Well, it, there's a difference in early intervention, three to five, and then when you're in school. Um, child, we're trying to stretch the child find requirements for three to five in, and using the requirement for early intervention for that um, to, to put in place a universal screening protocol for all the kids. Um, obviously, that also needs to be done in the schools, too. Um, the difference in three to five is to get, is to, you know, not all the kids are in school. So that's the problem, you know. Uh, idea, as Jennifer pointed out, deals when the kids are in school, 
parent says, I want my kid evaluated, I think as a teacher, a teacher says that, what do you do for the three to five population that's not in the school, uh, may come to the school, whether it's the district school or charter school or the intermediate school district, they wind up in it. So what kind of a, how does IDEA respond to that kind of situation? We've never had this before, really, under, under IDEA. I don't know how it's going to work out, but we're going to do everything we can to push the envelope to see if we can, you know, uh, get that kind of relief in place. Sorry, just to that point, the zero to three population, the, the child find responsibility is just lower. Uh, it's because you're not, the state is not interacting with kids at that point in a regular way. Because so much of IDEA is about normal, getting kids to the same place as other kids, if other kids are not getting schooling between zero to three, right? The, it's just not as strong with child find. Now, I think in Flint there's a different example because the state deliberately exposed kids to lead, but, um, in most cases, it's not, you're not going to necessarily have that hook. Um, and that doesn't mean that it can't be tested through litigation, but given the state of disability law in America, I would not, I wouldn't bet on it. Yeah. And you note that we didn't include zero to three in our case, because as Dr. Mona pointed out, and I think Peter pointed She's out. She's talking about blood lead testing. Yeah, but, no, no. Uh, but we didn't include zero to three, I'm just making the point, because they're doing, uh, Michigan has opened up their early on to that, so we thought we'd leave that alone. Update. The of these buildings are an absolute outrage. Except down on the lead of the uh, uh, I mean, the number of children have asthma uh, uh, is epidemic. And right. uh, when we're talking about uh, mold exposure and all that. When it comes to bottled water, uh, are the school lunches being prepared with bottled water? And who's monitoring that and making sure that happens? Good question. Yes. That's an excellent question. Flint has no policy. They're using bottled water. But there's no policy, district-wide policy, on the use of bottled water, even on making bottled water available to kids. Now, what Newark did is put uh, coolers in all the classrooms, at least. So I guess if the kids want to drink, they can. But we've heard different things from teachers in Flint that, yeah, you can give you know kids one bottle a day, or they have to go out and get you know, this kind of thing. I mean, it's it, 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 you have, if you're going to go to bottled water, as a temporary emergent me measure, there's got to be a uniform protocol uh, for dealing with that. All the faculty have to be uh, trained, you know, the custodial staff, the kitchens, the whole thing. Go ahead. I didn't say that. Flint case under IDEA 
to supervise all the changes that we want with the public school system. But laws like that don't apply to the school system. But there's no test, there are no tests within most public use statutes about whether somebody is disabled or not. It's just kind of the main mess, and you've got to clean it up. Here. Back. Yeah, I, just a couple of comments. Parents can be the messenger. 
you know, I can put up all the charts I want for any legislator. One parent saying, I didn't realize that my house was poisoning my child, okay? That's what can get people moving. And that's the responsibility of the people in this room. You know, when we talk about the law, the law ain't great, okay? So this is about moving policy and moving the culture and moving the mindset, and that's what we can do. So you're pessimistic, but that doesn't mean that we're not fighting hard to get stuff done. We've took questions for two. Two more quick questions, uh, right here and then right there. So if you're gonna pass, we'll go right to you then. disinvest in our communities, our schools, our kids, whatever it might be. We're going to get a new governor in a year from now. So the time, I think, for all of us in New Jersey to come together around this issue and come up, come up with a comprehensive set of solutions, some, of, some that are already part of the legislative, uh, it, as Jennifer pointed out and has been pointed out earlier, uh, are, uh, have been introduced as legislation. I think we have to kind of, as environmental advocates, grassroots community groups like Isles and others, Ironbound, and the Iron, all these groups, have, and, and education groups have to come together and create a, uh, what I would call an agenda for the next administration, multi-pronged agenda that you want, you want to see, both in terms of new statutes, new law, new protections, and also money in the various buckets that we need to start to put money in. Well, on that, please join me in thanking our panel for a great time. Hi there, Elise Pivnik again from this morning. Does anyone remember me saying in my welcoming remarks that I hope by the end of the day you are mad and inspired? <laughs> so I hope that's where, what you're, how you're feeling right now. And I just wanted to summarize some themes that I heard today and to be thinking about next steps. And I'm going to start, I think Peter Chen kind of referred to all of us as like everyone's doing their own thing when it comes to lead, right? We're all doing it. We all know a piece of it. Some of us know special lead at the school. Some of us know housing. Some of us know law. Some of us know social work, et cetera. 
So I think the challenge is how do we bring our, our specialties together to all be integrated for, indeed, that campaign for the next governor? How do we get this to be a strategic plan and guideposts for the next, the next governor? And I'm going to um, just describe some, uh, um, some topics here. And I'm kind of already envisioning we're all dividing ourselves up into subcommittees and we're going to come together. So just kind of think, think that image of that image. So we've all agreed, I think, that we need to increase awareness. Parents need to know, understand lead poisoning. Educators you know, really need to know what's going on because they're, they're, the, they're the guide here. And what we know is that our educators are woefully uninformed about this issue. They have not read research over the last 20 years, and I'm not talking about every educator, of course, but we have a huge job to do to bring our educators along so they can be helping our children. We've got mayors, we've got state elected officials. How is it that a mayor um, doesn't know the neighborhoods where children are being poisoned time and time again? Why isn't that mayor saying to his, house, his or her housing inspection staff, what's going on here? How come we're not, at, uh, how come we're not asking for a housing code to be, uh, to be implemented here? And I will emphasize, by the way, that prevention uh, of lead poisoning is a whole other conference, so I, we could talk about that for hours. Um, so we've got school nurses that are not up to date. We have social workers that are not up to date. We have community health workers that could be trained. Anyone who visits a home of a low-income family um, or a child at risk has an opportunity to deliver this message and do a good deed. They, you know, it's easy to train people. IELTS is doing that um, for anyone who goes into a home to do a healthy homes assessment. It's not rocket science to do a dust sample or look look at the ceiling and see that there's spots on there for mold uh, that are you know, contributing to mold and moisture, which is moving on. So we also have a problem of data um, in this state. And I'm going to put this on the committee's called data, data, data. And we need to map it. We, their states, um, Rhode, state of Rhode Island is the model for how they have mapped the location of children by neighborhood, not with identifying information, where the most lead poisoned children are coming from. Um, we need to map it by city council district. Let's map it by elected um, official district. You know, if I, was, I, if I was a city council member and I saw that, gee, all those kids were coming from my district, I think it might make me pay attention more. Right now, the data we have is dense and really inaccessible to people. I've been following the, uh, the state's annual lead report for years, and I, my eyes still glaze over when I look at it. So, and that's not just New Jersey, it's uh, a problem I think with a lot of lead reports. State of Rhode Island is the model and I encourage everyone to take a look at what they're, uh, what they're up to. And there's different, different categories which we can be reporting our lead data. Right now we just report the annual um, uh, results. So if 100 children were tested, we find out that X percent in the district had high leads. Well, a better statistic is to look at how many children are starting kindergarten with at least one high lead level. And what we know in Trenton is that, um, let's say the annual level is something like 6%, excuse me, 6%, but the cumulative rate is about 14%. And that's a really different uh, statistic, and nobody has access to that because we don't report it that way. So we also need to share the data. And I like what uh, I think Peter referred to as the warm handoff of data. And you know, we can be sharing this data. We have to find the way to share it with superintendents, with school nurses, in a way that protects privacy, but at least gives us a fighting chance to get children into the services they need at, a, at an early age. You know, maybe all of our districts need to have, you know, a lead czar or a lead coordinator whose job it is to have that information, that they don't spread widely, but they can focus on those children who need the services most. And I'm, you know, fully aware of HIPAA, and um, I really want us to explore ways that we can do it. I've, I've heard about, I think it's Washington, D.C., as a way that they can share it with the superintendent or the principals, for example. It's not widely shared, but it's a way that um, someone in that school system can be watching over that child. Um, so, uh, and how do we get special ed law to include children with lead? So, the challenge was laid out to us. I bet we could put our heads together and really think more about that and maybe we can come up with some good ideas. Um, we need more neuropsych testing. I think that's been made very clear. We know children are exposed. We know that it's not a single signature. We know that children are given a really are given poor interventions um, because we don't know better. 
You know, I think I said earlier what I've learned from Jay, you don't give a child who's been lead poisoned extra time on tests. It's just not the point. So can we identify those domains for children and really find a way to give them the help that we need? And, you know, um, Vicki Sudhalter's presentation gave us some very specific tools. You know, how many of our special ed staffs in the, uh, here in New Jersey have that kind of training? And why don't they? Um, so, and how do we monitor our children uh, from an early age? Can we find a way to do that through our special ed system? And can we use funding for Medicaid in a more creative way? Why does, um, we could, I know there's funding, Medicaid funding is available for case management. Why don't we have a system that every newborn that comes home from the hospital gets to have their home assessed and their water assessed for lead hazards and that be a starting point? And you can even take it back to the prenatal stage as well. Um, and that's not a heavy lift in terms of Medicaid funding is what I've been told. Um, and we need more research, you've heard this a lot, more research about what works. And um, Jay Schneider, um, has, we just submitted a, um, a proposal together to NIH, I should say it's really his proposal, we got Trenton in as the pilot city, um, trying to test some interventions. Well, it got turned down, uh, this method got turned down again. I was involved in an earlier proposal about two years ago, and the research was turned down mainly because the reader said it was an insignificant problem that the lead problem had been solved years ago. So that's what you're hearing at NIH. So we've got to change that. There's a lot, a lot of education we need to be doing. Um, and we need state and local uh, advisory groups. So I think we've heard, again, everybody's doing their thing. We need stakeholders to come together from education, social services, parent groups, housing groups, local government to really tackle this together. And that's not rocket science. We can do that. Um, and I, I like the idea of that we need positive messages. So I really loved that in one of the earlier presentations, you know, that um, Flint kids are smart and um, you, you can, uh, uh, I think as Vicki said or someone earlier said, you know, these kids can get to Princeton. I think Mary Jean, I think you were saying it. You know, we're, uh, all, the, all of us who um, uh, now have gray hair, which I do, you just can't tell right now. Um, uh, <laughs> that, um, you know, we all had, we all had uh, high levels of lead growing up. Um, and the structural and systemic response that we need, we really need to think about how we do that. And my last point, which David certainly spoke to, you know, we have this opportunity to put all of this, this information, these findings, these, um, uh, this passion for the issue into a new platform for the new governor. And you know, we, we know that one candidate already has included uh, elimination of lead poisoning in his, plat his, his four pillar platform, elimination of lead poisoning is one of, his, is one of the four. So that's one candidate. So we are in a position to fill out the flesh, in, the flesh on that, put the meat on the bones for what that means. And I challenge all of us to come together on that. So, um, uh, and I don't want to be the person that is the final arbiter here. I want to hear from other people. Anything I've missed, what people also think should be part of the closing remarks here. Any folks want to add something? Yes. People say lobbying as a dirty word, and we need to in You don't think you can lobby, you can. And if you need an invite to get around tax status or whatever, we can arrange for legislators to invite you. So don't see me out. I want to add one more piece because I'm glad to get it. I realized I crossed it out on, from an earlier uh, version of this as I was preparing it, which is one of the key things we're working on now with elected officials, Liz Moyles, one of the uh, key sponsors, is a lead safe certificate of bill here in New Jersey and, and possibly in Trenton, even doing it city by city if we can't get it uh, statewide. Janet Curry's research shows compellingly, and uh, in the Rochester case shows compellingly how if you can make homes lead safe, you are going to do go a far. You'll move. Uh, you'll move far in reducing uh, uh, lead poisoning and increasing test scores. So that's a really key piece. I think that we could all be working on as a legislative agenda. Anybody else? Correct.
face.